the holiness which the gospel requires will not be kept up or maintained either in the hearts or lives of men without a continual conflict, warring, contending, and that with all care, diligence, watchfulness, and perseverance in it. It is our warfare. And the scripture abounds in the discovery of the adversaries we have to conflict with. Their power and subtlety is also in directions and encouragements to their resistance. To suppose that gospel obedience will be maintained in our hearts and lives without a continual management of a vigorous warfare against its enemies is to deny the scripture in the experience of all that believe and obey God in sincerity. Satan, sin, and the world are continually assaulting it and seeking to ruin its interest in us. The devil will not be resisted, which it is our duty to do, 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9, without a sharp contest and conflict in a management in which we are commanded to take to ourselves the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, 12 and 13. Fleshly lusts continually war against our souls, 1 Peter 2, verse 11. And if we maintain not a warfare to the end against them, they will be our ruin. Nor will the power of the world be any otherwise avoided than by a victory over it, 1 John 5, verse 4 which will not be carried without contending. But I suppose it needs no great confirmation to any who know what it is to serve and obey God in temptations, that the life of faith and race of holiness will not be preserved nor continued in without a severe striving, laboring, contending, warring with diligence, watchfulness, and perseverance. So that I shall at present take it as a principle, notionally at least, agreed upon by the generality of Christians, if we don't like to be holy on these terms, then we must leave this alone, for on any other we shall never be so. If we faint in this course, if we give it over, if we think what we aim at in this is not worth the obtaining or preserving by such a severe contention all our days, we must be content to be without it. Nothing does so promote the interest of hell and destruction in the world as the presumption that a lazy, slothful performance of some duties and abstinence from some sins is that which God will accept of is our obedience. Crucifying of sin, mortifying our inordinate affections, contesting against the whole interest of the flesh, Satan, and the world, and that in inward actings of grace in all instances of outward duties, and that always, while we live in this world, are required of us in this. Here lies the first spring of the apostasy of many in the world, of them especially who betake themselves to and take up satisfaction in another way of duties than what the gospel requires. They had, it is possible, by their light and convictions, made so near approaches to it as to see what an incessant travail of soul is required to its attainment and preservation. They are like the Israelites traveling in the wilderness towards the land of Canaan, when they came near the borders and entrance of Canaan. They sent some to spy it out that they might know the nature and state of the land and country where they were going. These for their encouragement, and to evidence the fruitfulness of the earth, bring to them a branch with one cluster of grapes, so great and fair, that they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought also pomegranates and figs, number 13, verse 23. But withal... They told them of the hideous difficulties they were to conflict with, and that the people were strong. Their cities walled, and the Anakims dwell in amongst them, verse 28. This utterly disheartens the carnal people, and notwithstanding the prospect they had of the land that flowed with milk and honey, 
Back again they go into the wilderness, and there they perish. So it is with these persons. Notwithstanding the near approach they have made by light and convictions to the kingdom of God, as our Savior told a young man who was, as one of them, Mark 12:34, and a prospect they have of the beauty of holiness, yet they turn off from it again and perish in the wilderness. For upon the view they have of the difficulties which lie in the conflict mentioned, they fall under many disadvantages which at length utterly divert them from its pursuit. It's number one, weariness of the flesh not enduring to comply with that constant course of duties, continually returning upon it which is required thereunto. Various pleas will be made for an exemption from them, at least in some troublesome instances, and a carnal mind will not lack pretenses to countenance the flesh and its weariness. Hereon one duty after another is first omitted and then utterly foregone. Neglect of a vigorous constancy in subduing the body and bringing of it into subjection, commended by the apostle in his own example, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, is with many the beginning of this kind of apostasy. These things, I say, will oft times fall out that through the weariness and aversion of the flesh, countenance by various pretenses of the carnal mind. Sundry duties will be omitted. But this is the faith and trial of the saints. Here is the difference between sound believers and those who are acted only on by convictions. Those of the first sort will sooner or later, for the most part speedily, be humbled for such omissions and recover their former diligence according to the prayer of the psalmist. Psalm 119, verse 176. But where this ground is won by the flesh, and men grow satisfied under the loss of any duty, it is an evidence of a hypocritical backsliding heart. Number two. When men are come to the height of their convictions and proceed no further, indwelling sin with its lusts and corrupt affections which have for a while been checked and mated by light will insensibly prevail and weary the mind with solicitations for the exercise of its old dominion for the spring of it being not dried the bitter root of it being not digged up nor withered it will not cease until it has broke down all the bounds that were fixed unto it and bear down convictions with force and violence. Number three, ignorance of the true way of making application to the Lord Christ for grace and supplies of the Spirit, to bring them to or preserve them in a state of gospel holiness is of the same importance. Without this, to dream of being holy according to the mind of God is to renounce the gospel. We need not look further for men's apostasy than this. If they are satisfied with such a holiness, such an obedience as is not derived to us by the grace of Christ, nor wrought in us by the Spirit of Christ, nor preserved in us by the power of Christ, the way hereof such persons are always ignorant of, and at length do openly despise, Yet may men as well see without the sun or light, or breathe without the air, or live without natural spirits, as engage into or abide in the practice of gospel holiness, without continual applications to Christ, the fountain of all grace for spiritual strength enabling thereunto. The way and means of this, these persons being ignorant of and unacquainted with, the holiness which the gospel requires becomes to them a thing strange and burdensome, which therefore they desert and refuse. If therefore it be true that without Christ we can do nothing, that in our life to God he lives in us, and efficiently is our life, if from him as a head nourishment is supplied to every living member of the body, if the life which we live be by the faith of the Son of God, 
And if the only way of deriving these things and all supplies of spiritual strength from him be by the exercise of faith in him, it follows unavoidably that all those who are unacquainted with this way, who do not know how to make their application to him for this end and purpose, can never persevere in a pursuit of gospel holiness. So has it fallen out in no other wise with them concerning whom we speak? Is ignorance of the righteousness of God, or of Christ being the end of the law for righteousness to them that do believe, is a reason why men go about to establish a righteousness of their own, and will not submit to the righteousness of God, so ignorance of the grace which is continually to be received from Christ in a way of believing, that we may be holy with gospel holiness, is a reason why so many turn off from it to another kind of holiness of their own framing, which yet is not another, because it is none at all. But many are so far from endeavoring after or abiding in gospel holiness on this foundation of continual supplies of grace from Jesus Christ to that end, is that they avowedly despise all holiness and obedience springing from that fountain or growing on that root in which case God will judge. In the meantime, I say, in a manner is evident, that one principal reason why men turn off from it upon the prospect of the difficulties that attend it and the oppositions that are made to it is their unbelief and ignorance of the way of making application to Christ by faith for supplies of spiritual strength and grace. Number four, unacquaintedness with the true nature of evangelical repentance is another cause of it. This is that grace which comfortably carries the souls of believer through all their failings, infirmities, and sins. Nor are they able to live to God one day without the constant exercise of it. They find it as necessary to the continuance of spiritual life as faith itself. It is not only a means of our entrance into, but it belongs essentially to our gospel state and our continuance in it. In this belongs that continual humble self-abasement from a sense of the majesty and holiness of God, with a disproportion of the best of our duties to his will, which believers live and walk in continually, and he that is not sensible of a gracious sweetness and usefulness in it, knows not what it is to walk with God. By this does God administer several encouragements to our souls to abide in our way of obedience, notwithstanding the many discouragements and despondencies we meet with. In brief, take it away, and you overthrow faith and hope and all other graces. Those, therefore, who are unacquainted with the nature and use of this grace and duty, who can taste no spiritual refreshment in all its sorrows, who know nothing of it but legal troubles, anguish, fear, and distraction, will not endure the thought of living in the practice of it all their days which yet is as necessary to gospel holiness as faith itself. Men, I say, falling into this condition, finding all these difficulties to conflict with, and lying under these disadvantages, if anything, will offer itself in the room of this costly holiness, will readily embrace it. Hence, as some betake themselves to a pretense of morality, which is to many as a mere pretense, and made use of only to countenance themselves in the neglect of the whole of that obedience which the gospel openly requires. So others do, under other expressions, retreat to the mere duties of their own light, and these is only required in them, with some peculiar reliefs to the flesh in what is burdensome to it, as, for example, there is nothing that the flesh more rises up in a dislike of and in opposition to than constancy in the duty of prayer in private and families on all occasions, especially if attended to in a spiritual manner, as the gospel requires, but in itself and as to the substance of it. It is a duty which the light of nature exacts of us. But whereas this may prove burdensome to the flesh, a relief is borrowed from a pretense of gospel light and liberty, 
that men don't need to pray at any time unless their own spirits or light previously required of them, which is to turn the grace of God into an occasion of sinning. By this means some have gotten a holiness in which, for the most part, it seems indifferent to them whether they pray at any time or not, and other instances of the like kind might be given. Upon the whole matter, to free themselves from the state, so uneasy to flesh and blood, so contrary to all the imaginations of the carnal mind, some men have betaken themselves to another in which they have or pretend to have no conflict against sin nor to need any application to the Lord Christ for supplies of spiritual strength, which belongs not to that holiness which the gospel requires and which God accepts. It may be said that in some of the instances before given, especially in that of the papacy, there is an appearance of a greater conflict with and more hardships put on the flesh than in any other way of obedience that is pleaded for. And there is indeed such an appearance, but it is no more. The oppositions that arise against their austerities are from without, or from the nature as it is weak, but not as it is carnal. It is possible that sin may not be concerned in what they do, neither in its power nor reign. Yea, so far as it is leavened by superstition, it acts itself therein no less than it does in others by fleshly lusts but it is an internal, spiritual, immediate opposition to its being and all its actings that it rises up with such rage against as to worry those who have not that living principle of faith in which the victory over it does peculiarly appertain. This evangelical holiness will not allow of, nor will consist with the constant habitual omission of any one duty or the satisfaction of any one lust of the mind or of the flesh. As we are in all instances of duty to be perfecting holiness in the fear of God, Second Corinthians 7 verse 1, so no provision is to be made for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof, Romans 13 verse 14. This is that which loses it so many friends in the world. Would it barter with the flesh? Would it give and take allowances in any kind, or grant indulgence to any one sin? Multitudes would have a kindness for it which now bid it defiance. Everyone would have an exemption for that sin which he likes best, and which is most suited to his inclinations and carnal interests. And this would be virtually a dispensation for all unholiness whatever. But these are the terms of the gospel. No one duty is to be neglected. No one's sin is to be indulged, and they are looked upon as intolerable. Naaman would not give himself up unto the worship of the God of Israel, but with this reserve that he might also bow in the house of Rimmon, whereon his power and preferment did depend. Many things the young man in the gospel boasted himself to have done, and was doubtless willing to continue in the performance of them, but yet... Through his whole course, the love of the world had the prevalency in him, and when he was tried in that instance, rather than relinquish it, he gave up the whole. But this is a law of the gospel. Although it provide a merciful relief against those daily sins which we are overtaken with by our frailty and weakness, or surprised into by the power of temptations against the bent of our minds and habitual inclination of our wills, First Peter 4, verses 1 and 2. Yet it allows not the cherishing or practice of any one sin, whatever internal or external. An habitual course in any sin is utterly inconsistent with evangelical obedience, First John 3, verses 6 and 9. Yea, it requires indispensably that we be engaged in our minds and wills in an opposition to all sin, and in a constant endeavor after its not being in us, either in the root or in the fruit of it. It will not connive at or comply with any inordinate affection, any habitual sinful distemper, nor the first motions of sin that are in the flesh. This is that perfection which is required in the new covenant, Genesis 17.1. That sincerity, integrity, freedom from guile, walking after the spirit and not after the flesh, is that newness of life which the gospel everywhere prescribes to us. 
On no other terms but universality in obedience and opposition to sin will it approve of us. 1 John 3, verses 7 to 10. And this occasions the turning aside of many from the pursuit of an endeavor to be holy according to the rule of the gospel, when by light and convictions they come to take a view of what is required therein too. It dislikes them. They cannot bear it. And therefore they either at once or gradually give over all ways of pursuing their first design. And men break with the gospel on this account by the means ensuing, number one. They cannot make the same judgment of sin that the gospel does. Nor will judge all those things to be sin and evil which the gospel declares so to be. Yea, we have some come unto that Pharisaism that they scarce think anything to be sinful or worth taking notice of, unless it be openly flagitious. Under this darkness and ignorance, all sorts of filthy, noisome lust may be cherished in the hearts of men, keeping them at as great and real a distance from the holiness of truth as the most outrageous outward sins can do. And this neglect or refusal to comply with the rule of the gospel before laid down is grounded and promoted by two occasions. Number one, they have a willing insensibility of the guilt of some unmortified lust. This they will abide in and cherish. For their minds being habituated to it, they find no great evil in it, nor do see any cogent reason why they should forego it. So was it with the young man with respect to the love of the world. He was sorry that it could not be evangelically obedient whilst he retained it, but seeing that could not be, he did not discern any such evil in it, nor was sensible of any such guilt from it, nor could apprehend any such equality in or necessity of gospel holiness that he should renounce the one for the embracing of the other. So will it be when any lust is made familiar to the mind. It will not be terrified with it nor can see any great danger in it. It is between such a soul and sin as it is between the devil and the witch, or one that has a familiar spirit. At the first appearance of the devil, be it in what shape it will, it cannot but bring a tremor and fear on human nature. But after a while he becomes a familiar, and when alone he is to be feared, he is not feared at all. The poor deceived wretch then thinks him in his power so that he can use or command him as he sees good, whereas he himself is absolutely in the power of the devil. Men may be startled with sin in its first appearance on their first convictions or its first dangerous efforts, but when it becomes their familiar, they suppose it is a thing in their own power which they can use or not use as they see occasion though indeed themselves are the servants of corruption being overcome by it and brought into bondage. So it is inconceivable how little sense of guilt in some sins men find after they are habituated to them. In some sins, I say, for with respect to sins absolutely against the light of nature, conscience will not easily be bribed not to condemn them. It will not in such cases be speechless until it be seared and made senseless. But there are sins not accompanied with so great an evidence, yet attended with no less guilt than those which directly militate against the light of nature. In this case, when the word of the gospel comes as it is, living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, as a discoverer and judge of the thoughts and intents of the heart, when it comes and discovers the secret frames, figments, imaginations, and inclinations of the mind, and condemns what it is in the least measure or manner, irregular, when it will not be put off nor accept of any composition or compensation by the most strict and rigid profession and other things, men are ready to withdraw themselves to the rule of their own light and reason, which they find more gentle and tractable. Number two. A dereliction of the gospel on this account. With respect to the inwardness, spirituality, and extent of its commands is much increased under the influence of corrupt opinions. And of this nature are all those which tend to the extenuation of sin. For some there are who suppose that there is not such a provoking guilt, such a spiritual outrage in sin as others pretend. 
His multitudes as they judge are needlessly troubled and perplexed about it. A generous mind, free from superstitious fears and dark conceits imbibed in education, will deliver the mind of men from the trouble of such apprehensions. A great sense of the guilt of small sins is an engine to promote the interest of preachers and those who pretend to the conduct of conscience. The filth and pollution of sin is a metaphor which few can understand, and none ought to be concerned in. That the power of the remainders of indwelling sin is a foolish notion and that the disorderly frames of the heart and the mind through darkness, deadness, spiritual indisposition, or other secret irregularities are fancies, not sins, which we need not be troubled at ourselves, nor make any acknowledgment of to God. These and the like opinions are the pharisaical corbin of our age, corrupting the whole law of our obedience. And it were easy to manifest how perilous and ruinous they are to the souls of men, what powerful instruments in the hand of Satan to eclipse the glory of the grace of Christ on the one hand, and to promote apostasy from holiness in the hearts and lives of men on the other. I shall only say, set the corrupt heart of men by any means at liberty from an awe and reverence of the holiness of God and His law with respect to the inward actings and frames of the soul, with a sense of guilt where they are irregular, and a necessity of constant humiliation before God thereon, and an equally constant application of itself to the Lord Christ for grace and mercy, and it is wholly in vain to think of fixing any bounds to the progress of sin. The ignorance of this is that which has produced in some the proud imagination of perfection when they are far enough from bringing their consciences and lives to the rule of the gospel, but only aggravate their guilt by attempting to bend that inflexible rule to their own perverse and crooked minds. In this case, carnal interest, which takes in and comprises all the circumstances of man, calls for an indulgence to some one sin or other which the gospel will not admit of. Pride or ambition, covetousness or love of this present evil world and the perishing things of it, uncleanness or sensuality in eating and drinking, Self-exultation and boasting, vainglory, idleness, one or other must be spared. One thing or other, I say, on the account of carnal interest, either because small or useful or general or suited to a natural temper, or as is supposed made necessary by the occasions of life, must be reserved. Where this resolution prevails, as men are absolutely excluded from any real interest in gospel holiness, which will admit of no such reserves, so will not fail to lead them into open apostasy of one kind or another. For such persons are unapproved of God in all that they do, and so have no ground for expectation of his blessing or assistance. For the allowance of the least sin is such an impeachment of sincerity as casts a man out of a covenant communion with God. This is that offending in one point which ruins a man's obedience and renders him guilty against the whole law, James 2.10. Any one actual sin makes a man guilty of the curse of the whole law as it contains the covenant of works. And the willing allowance of a man's self in any one sin habitually breaks the whole law as it contains the rule of our obedience in the covenant of grace. And if in this disapproved condition men meet with outward prosperity in the world, their danger will be increased as well as their guilt aggravated, and the utmost care of professors is required in this manner. For there seems to be among many an open indulgence into habitual disorders which hazards their whole covenant interest and must fill them with uncertainty in their own minds. High time it is for all such persons to shake off every weight and the sin that does so easily beset them, and to run with redoubled diligence the remainder of the race that is set before them.